I I can't wait any longer. <laughs> I was trying to outlast this guy behind me. He's a, I don't know, he's a some sort of rabbi doing a, a Torah lesson in the neighborhood. I'm I'm on the other side of the world at the moment, and uh, they do things a little differently out here. It's almost 11 o'clock at night, and this guy's shouting at his rooftops talking about something in the Torah or something. I don't know. But uh, he's got a, a loud phone. I, I just wasn't expecting it so late at night. Um, but he's out here doing his thing, and you know what? We're out here doing our thing. I hope that my loud, annoying voice can drown out this. <laughs> hey, hey, yo, forget about it, Lowell. What's up, Mr. Red? How you doing? Yes. Okay. I am so excited about today's show. I can't even tell you. By the way, I did not get a chance to do my blog yet today, my vlog episode. That will be coming out um, probably tomorrow. Just didn't get around to it. Um, busy, busy day. Tell me, Mr. Red, how do I sound, by the way, right now? I just want to know before we begin. Am I am I too uh, am I too low? Is this guy, is this rabbi dude behind me um, uh, drowning everything out? That's just I just need to know that before we can properly start. And then I'll do my introduction and we could talk about of this and we could talk about of that and Yada, 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 X, Y, Z, one, two, three, you know me, A, B, C, it's easy as one, two, three, I think I said the one, two, three already. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad I have a little water here to wet my whistle. I hear it's really hot in America right now, by the way, that's what everybody's telling me, that it's super duper warm, like beyond heat wave craziness, so I hope you're all staying cool out there. Um, all right, let's just let's just launch into this. So I read this article many, many years ago. Same article. I found it absolutely fascinating. It's from a website called Atlas Obscura. And it's by a guy named Dan Noshowitz. So Nosowitz, I hope I'm not butchering his last name. I think he's a Jew, which is kind of funny. I, I love that a Jew wrote this about Italian linguistics from New Jersey. I think that's great. It makes sense because New York Jews and New Jersey Italians are almost like cousins. I, I can't explain why that is. It doesn't make any sense, but I assure you it's 100% true. Um, and I think that there's an affinity between the two cultures in a way. They're, they're very similar, um, that, that sort of thing. I have not seen the trailer for The Many Saints of New York, but they were shooting it right in my backyard. So I'm sure it's going to be great. Um, so, yeah. So when I read this, I was like, I was just blown away because, you know, I, you always hear you always hear that that phrase, you know, gabagoo. I never know what gabagoo means or what it's supposed to mean. You know, I'm very familiar with other sort of colloquial, I guess you would call them almost colloquialisms. A little bit and um it wasn't until i sat down and read this article that not only not only did it reshape my understanding of some of this terminology but it reshaped my understanding of italy and really many different countries in the world i mean this stuff blew blew my mind I, and i tried to share it from the rooftops um you know near and far with anybody who would read this article because I just thought it was so fascinating. Um, let's just dive. Let's just dive into it, okay? Here, let's put it on this kind of view. I like that view. I'm down in a little corner here, doing my thing. How Capicola became Gabagoo, the Italian New Jersey accent explained a linguistic exploration. I tell you, this thing melted my mind. Yes, the Sopranos are represented here you got Polly walnuts and you got um james gandolfini as tony soprano right of course and of course you can't it can't really be new jersey or a mob thing or an italian thing if there's not a uh red plaid um red plaid checkered cloth tablecloth there a little cup of espresso uh this is kind of microscopic print so i'm going to try my best to read it for you 
Uh, don't eat the gabagool, Grandma says. Blah, 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 let's say that again. Don't eat the gabagool, Grandma says, Meadow Soprano. By the way, I went to middle school and high school with Meadow Soprano's first cousin. She's Jamie Lee Sigler, and I know her cousin, Jackie Sigler. Hope you're well, Jackie. What's up? How you doing? There's my father-in-law is just coming back from this, this Torah lesson that they uh, were doing across the street and uh, having a good time. Laila Tov. Um, so, sorry, where was I? Okay, so Meadow Soprano on an early episode of The Sopranos, perhaps the most famous de depiction of the Jersey Italian culture in the past few decades. It's nothing but fat and nitrates talking about the Capicola, a.k.a. the Gabagoo. So, <laughs> um, the pronunciation of Gabagool, a mutation of the word Capicola, might surprise a casual viewer, although it and words like it should be familiar to viewers of other New Jersey-based shows like The Jersey Shore and The Real Housewives of New Jersey, where food often drives conversation. The casts are heavily Italian-American, but few of them can actually speak in any real way the Italian language. This also kind of blew my mind, and they get into kind of why that is. Blows my mind. Regardless, when they talk about food, even food that's widely known by non-Italian people, they often use a specific accent. Now, real quick sidebar here. I was talking about how I feel like the New York Jew is the cousin of the New Jersey Italian, and it's the same way. In the same way that it was, they were just saying um, that they can't in any. And this is obviously a gross, broad generalization, but as a whole, m many of them do not, are not fluent in the Italian language or understand the Italian language. It's the same thing with Jews and Hebrew. If you went to Hebrew school, you might know how to read and write Hebrew, but you can't speak it necessarily and understand it. And this is fascinating. I myself went to Hebrew school. I can read Hebrew. I can write Hebrew. I can now I can speak a little Hebrew. But at the time, I didn't know. I, I, you know, there was a long time where I was reading and writing stuff that I didn't know how to speak, if that makes any sense. So it's like, and it's the same thing with Yiddish, which is a sort of a broken, bastardized language. It's German and Hebrew combined. Actually, the name from us, the name of this channel, the whole, the brand from us, from us is Yiddish, believe it or not. And so it's just interesting how you know, and most Yiddish has become sort of like a lost language. Many Ashkenazi Jews might know a word of Yiddish here and there, but they can't fluently speak Yiddish. And I feel like there's a parallel there with a lot of American uh, Italians or Italian Americans. I'm saying not all Italian Americans, it's a gross generalization. Some, some Italian Americans, specifically in the, the, the Northeast, Robbie Bloodshed was just wearing my Gabagool Misfit Soprano shirt. So question, Robbie, you would think that somebody somewhere would have made a band called Gabagool. I mean, if when you take the New Jersey and the Misfits and the Italian thing, like all together, like it's kind of a genius name, Gabagool. Like I'm kind of jealous that I didn't think of that. It's perfect. Absolutely perfect for that um so i'm kind of curious to know where that comes from the gabagool shirt um regardless when they talk about food even food that's widely known by non-italian people they often use a specific accent i have witnessed this many many times with many many italians uh ravi is italian i don't know ravi if you can speak to that but uh it's i have definitely seen it and and here they say as my friend uh my acquaintance, whatever you want to call him, uh, Sal B, used to always put this accent on any sort of food he was talking about. Um, and the article says, it's a weird one. Mozzarella, because something like mozzadelle. And it says something like, because there's no official, it's not like a written word. It's just 
it's something that's phonetically said in a certain way. And it almost like the more that you sort of abbreviate it. And, you know, I use this language all the time, but not in like, you know, in a very tongue in cheek way I use it, you know, but there's no right way to spell mozzadel. You just say mozzarella. I, I, I think that's not the right I'm pronouncing or they're it's spelled not the way I would pronounce it. When I hear guys do it, I always hear mozzarella, like something like that. And it says mozzadel. And ricotta becomes rigot. Rigot. <laughs> it's so weird. Ricotta cheese. Rigot. Prosciutto becomes prosciutto. See, I don't like his phonetic. His phonetic spellings are a little off from the way I understand it. Prosciutto, you know. Uh, there is a mangling of the language in an instantly identifiable way. Fine, this is this is so crazy to me. It's it's amazing. It's fascinating. It's wonderful. Final syllables are deleted. Certain consonants are swapped with others. Certain vowels are mutated in certain places. Robbie says, I took Italian in high school, didn't take it serious. My grandparents are from Sicily, so I know some of the language from them. Exact, exactly like Yiddish. That's exact. You learn Yiddish from your grandparents. I've been listening to free YouTube videos to learn how to really speak it. There you go. Um, I don't want to be that typical Jersey Italian who can't speak it, so I've been changing that. I can have small conversations I feel now. So you would agree, Robbie, who's born and raised in New Jersey, is partially Italian or mostly Italian or three quarters of Italian. I don't know what exactly his combination is. Um, would agree that there are many Italians in New Jersey who don't actually speak Italian. Not that it should be a requisite, because again, a lot of American Jews don't speak Hebrew, as I said. So it's like a very, it's a very interesting thing. Um, so that, that is fascinating. Final syllables are deleted because of mozzarella, because mozzadel. So they completely, mozzarella, you completely erase the A at the end. Regatta, rigot. Robbie, have you ever heard, if Robbie's in the audience, have you ever heard why that is? Is there a reason? Or it's, just, it's just the thing you do, right? It's just the way it is. Most immigrant groups in the United States retain certain words and phrases from the old language, even if the modern population can't speak it, just as I was saying about Yiddish. Uh, but for people outside these groups, and even often inside of them, it's next to impossible to pick out a specific regional accent in the way a Jewish American says chala, or a Korean American says, I can't say that, jingye, jingye. Uh, how can someone who doesn't speak the language possibly have a regional accent? Isn't that, that's crazy. Yet uh, Italian Americans do. It's even been parodied on an episode of The Kroll Show Comedian Nick Kroll's character, Bobby Bottle Service, a Mike the Situation Sorrentino type, describes his lunch in a thick accent, emanating the final syllable of each item. Eliminating, sorry, not emanating, eliminating the final syllable of each item. Capacol, he says, pointing at the Capicola. Mortadel, he says, as the camera pans over to thin pale arrangements of mortadella. Coca-Cola, <laughs> Coca he finishes as the camera moves on a glass of Coca. See, that's hilarious. Capicola made famous in its mutations by the Sopranos. So that's another thing, too. It, I mean, I don't think I was familiar with the term gabagoo before the Sopranos. I think the Sopranos really brought that mainstream in every every you know household understands what gabagool is as a result um capicola made famous in its mutation by the sopranos gets even more mutated for co comedic effect on the office where it becomes gabagool um i spoke to a few linguists and experts on italian american culture to figure out why a kid from patterson new jersey who doesn't speak italian would earnestly ask for a taste of mozzarella. The answer takes us way back through history and deep into the completely chaotic world of Italian 
linguistics. Now, up to this point, and I've read this article before, I've actually read it several times because it really does. I just think it's fascinating. I've said that like a hundred times. Um, this is the part of the article where my, your jaw just drops because, you know, up to this point, when you think, when I thought of Italy, I always just thought of, you know, Italy is Italy. It's the, it's the old country. It's the mother country, right? The mother tongue, you know, everybody, you know, eats pasta. Everybody just hangs out and does, you know, uh, does their thing, yada, yada, yada. I don't know. Um, like it's just all, uh, it's a whole. And as it turns out, that could not be more wrong at all. Hi, I just got here. I'm confused. Rock and Roller says, hi, I just got here. I'm confused on the differences between Italian New Jersey and the New York accent. For example, the awe in coffee. I mean, it's like a little, it's similar. It's similar. It's not that, I wouldn't say it's that different. Um. Robbie says, I believe the way we pronounce certain Italian foods has to do with dialects, too. So many of the foods are called different things in Italy. My grandmother speaks a mofetta, mofetta di uh, dialect, which is grandfather Sicilian. Interesting. You'd be surprised how many different small things are changed because of dialect. I, that doesn't surprise me. I, I totally, I could, I could, I could imagine that for sure. I can imagine that for sure. Um, all right, this is where all right, this is where this thing jumps off. Ready? One thing I need to tell you because this is something that is not clear even for linguists, let alone the layperson, meaning like the average Joe. The linguistic situation in Italy is quite complicated. Said says I, I'm about to butcher this name. I'm so sorry, Maria Pola de Imperio. A professor in the linguistics department at Ax. Uh, now I'm going to really butcher that one. I'm not even going to say that. At, at a university who was born in Naples and studied in Ohio before moving to France. The situation is so complicated that the terms used to describe pockets of language are not widely agreed upon. So the terms even used to, to describe these different little, you know, sects of language are not even, you know, there's no whole, whole, you know, unanimous decision as to how to label them. Some use language, some use dialect, some use accent, some use variation. Linguists like to argue about the terminology of this kind of thing. Wow. I mean, at the end of the day, maybe you can chalk it up to semantics. Some, a lot of it could be just semantic stuff, but, you know, I, maybe not. The basic story is this. Italy is a very young country made up of many very old kingdoms awkwardly stapled together to make a patchwork whole. Before 1861, these different kingdoms, Sardinia, Rome, Tuscany, Venice, Sicily, they were called different things at the time, but they roughly correspond to those regions now. Those were basically different countries. Its citizens didn't speak the same language, didn't identify as countrymen. Sometimes they were even at war with each other. The country was unified over a period from around 1861 until World War I. So from 1861 until about 1918, right? So that's 18 plus uh, 48 plus, um, what, like 58, 57, 58 years that it took to unify Italy. Now, this is not the only example of this. This is what happened in Iraq. Again, I <laughs> here's a boring history lesson. Iraq, you know, you hear all the all this back and forth about how Iraq, you know, you got the Kurds and the Serbs, but not the Serbs, uh, the Kurds and the there's somebody else. There's a bunch of different guys and they all are Muslim, but they all like sort of do different stuff. It's because Iraq is three different regions and like, like kind of like nations of people that were also stapled together. And that's why they fight each other so much. That's why there's so much infighting in Iraq. And you always hear, again, you hear about the Kurds getting their asses handed to them or whatever. That's what that's about. It's the same thing for where I'm at right now. I'm in Israel 
Israel was a place called the British Mandate of Palestine, which was and people like to you know get get hung up on the word Palestine, but basically, it was a nationless region for thousands of years that was ruled by the Ottoman Empire until World War One, when the Ottoman Empire ceased to exist because they were the you know they were allied with Germany. They lost World War One, and and it there, it was no more. Uh, Britain took over the region and started chopping up the area to make countries. For instance, what some people don't realize, the country of Jordan is actually three-fifths of the British, Pandit, pa uh, British Mandate of Palestine, which means that already when you think about Israel and you know the British Mandate of Palestine left over, it's only two-fifths of, of the full amount of the British Mandate of Palestine. Get it? So three-fifths went to Palestinians, who then became Jordanian Palestinians, and then the remainder was going to be a, a, a nation of Palestine and a nation of Israel. Israel accepted these terms. The, the Arabs did not accept the terms for the, the, the partition of Palestine. They fought. There was a war of independence. That's how Israel becomes a country. So it's just interesting. It's funny. It's funny. Nobody nobody seems to mind or care or whatever about what happened in, in Italy all these all these years ago. But it, I, man, it is it, you have to think about it in a similar context. Um, so they were all like kind of in I would say insensitively lashed together because when you think about and here's what's so interesting. Here's what's super, super fascinating about this stuff. You have, when, when I hear these names, when I hear stuff like Sardinia, Rome, Tuscany, Venice, Sicily, I'm thinking of food. I'm thinking of different types of food. You know, I don't know, like Tuscan pasta or, you know, uh, I know there's like Sardinia dishes, you know, like I, I, I think of like food and it's amazing how like you know food connects one person to a region and i don't know it's just it is fascinating to me um sicilians were absolutely looked down upon my grandfather especially because they're much darker skin my girlfriend got me a dna test recently and on my sicilian side i'm at actually a nice little percentage of africa yes so what robbie's referring to and it's been dramatized in movies just if you watch true romance <laughs> if you watch true romance they uh they go they go on about it um i'm not going to say what i would i'm not going to quote the movie on youtube but robbie i'm sure knows what line i'm talking about um yes the moors conquered sicily and there a lot of the dark skin of sicily comes from african blood and it's yeah, it's it's, it's fascinating stuff. Truly, uh, I really I want to get one of those kits. Uh, my my dad and my mom both did kits, so I technically don't have to. Here's what we found out: on my dad's side, we got 0.01 percent Japanese. So I'm ninety seven point nine percent. I'm ninety seven point nine percent Ashkenazi Jew. And then like that 0.011, you know, whatever, one of the percentages was Japanese. Somebody from like 700 years ago, like one of my great grandfathers or something. It's like Japanese, something crazy like that. Isn't that crazy? That stuff is insane. Um, Robbie asked, do they have strong dialects in Israel? I mean, of course. I mean, Israel is a, I mean, so I, I'll talk about this in my other series. I, I really want to keep it about it, uh, Italy. But Israel is a is a melting pot of various different patchworks of everything. We're going to be talking to my grandfather-in-law, my wife's grandfather, who's from Karkuk, Iraq, and we're going to hear his story. It's pretty heavy stuff. Um, kind of off topic, but Glenn and Jerry are both Italian, right? They seem to have different accents, not sure. Yeah, they are definitely both Italian, and this does kind of concern them and the, the place that they grew up. They, you know, this is Bergen County and whatnot. The basic story is this. We talked about that, right? Um, 
so 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 those were the regions those regions were basically different countries what we were talking about rome tuscany all that place um its citizens didn't speak the same language didn't identify as countrymen sometimes were even at war with each other the country was unified over a period from around 1861 until world war one and that's about like 59 58 years something like that and during that period the wealthier northern part so the northern part was very wealthy the wealthier northern parts of the newly constructed Italy imposed unfair taxes and basically annexed the poorer southern parts. As a result, southern Italians ranging from just south of Rome all the way down to Sicily fled in huge numbers to other countries, including the United States. So the influx of of immigrants into America from Italy is direct, is a lot of Southern Italians specifically because of finances. And it's just interesting how, when you think about, a, a, when, when you think about Italian Americans, you're really talking about Southern Italians because the Northern Italian families, uh, you, you don't hear anybody from, any part of New Jersey. And I wonder, again, Robbie could speak to this way better than, than I ever could. Um, or anybody, I think Dag Dagger love is in Lodi. I don't know if he knows about it. Dagger love says Glenn and Jerry have different accents because they're from different sides. of Lodi. <laughs> Yes. Lodi was lashed together. <laughs> there were a bunch of city streets that were lashed together <laughs> from Grove street to MacArthur Ave. Um, what was I talking about? Oh yeah. So, so my question, so what's interesting is when you think about, yeah, when you think about Italian Americans that the, when they trace their, you trace the families, it's all Southern Italians, you know, um, not Northern Italians. Um, so they all came here and I guess, you know what I love about this article so much. I really, truly love it so much. And the thing that I love about it is because this is the story of America, like the America that that's awesome, you know, because when I think about like what like the good stuff about America, the stuff that makes America great, <laughs> the stuff that makes America awesome is that it is a as as it likes to be identified, even though it seems to be conflicting with itself today. Boy, these last two episodes have kind of gotten pseudo political. I was not expecting this. Um is that we're a country of immigrants that we bring the flavor americans bring the flavor from the mother countries that they come from they bring some some cultural aspect and it all gets unified as american stuff because you know what italian food is most certainly italian food first and foremost right like it, it's always going to be italian food but like when I think like Italian food is American to me, you know what I mean? A per perfect example, pizza. Pizza is technically an Italian food, but pizza really, the real pizza, pizza as we understand it today, pizza got its start in New York City. Do you know that? The first real pizza is from New York, made by Italians who came over here. And pizza is like the most American food there is, right? You think about the Ramones, you think about pizza, right? So it's just kind of it just kind of really fascinates me how like you know, especially today where people are just like you know people are so concerned about immigrants and yada yada yada. It's like, dude, immigrants is what makes this place so awesome. You know, same thing with uh, the the people getting bummed out about cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation is what got us pizza. Cultural appropriation is what got us rock and roll. Cultural appropriation is a good thing. Cultural appropriation is what, frankly, kind of brought or, or uh, helped to destroy some of the segregation that was in the United States in the 50s. You know, uh, I did a whole thing about this with Screaming Jay Hawkins, or, you know, talk, mentioned a lot in the Screaming Jay Hawkins video. My point is, I just, I just think it's awesome. I, I think I love hearing this stuff, and I love to think that what makes America unique and great and wonderful, in the same way that, and I know that people would disagree. And by the way, 
you know, I had some I had some not very nice comments about the fact that I'm in Israel right now. If you have nothing nice to say, just don't say anything at all. Really, truly. I mean, just go, just move on. I don't want to fight with you. I don't want to get into a thing with you. Just, just, if you don't like it, you can unfollow, unfollow, get out of here. I'm in Israel. So what? That's, that's, that's what it is. And, and I'm going to talk about it. I'm not going to, you know, I was like, oh man, I can't talk about the fact that I'm in Israel on YouTube. I don't want people to like, you know, be mad at me or whatever. I was like, well, fuck that shit. Fuck all you guys. I'm yes. I'm in Israel right now. So what? Yes, I'm here. Israel, it too. You know, the Israel that you don't hear about in the news, Israel is a lot like America in the sense that it's a melting pot. There are so many cultures. There's so many different types of people that come here and help make Israel such a unique, diverse place. And I think that's the special sauce as to what America, what makes America so great or the good things, the redeeming qualities of America, because I have a lot of problems with America that I don't get into on my shows and whatnot. Mr. Red agrees. He says, indeed, exactly, indeed, immigrants are the melting pots of this country. They, they really, really are. Uh, Robbie says, without cultural appropriation, no rock and roll. No, any, how about no music, period? Like, literally, like, no, like, music doesn't evolve without cultural appropriation of some kind. And I hate that it's called cultural appropriation. Why can't we think of a better way to describe it? You know, cult the cultural appropriation, I think, does exist, but I don't think it's as prevalent or it should be as worried about as people want to worry about it. You know, you'll get really upset over certain things. And I just, I just don't see, especially in the realm of music, that really makes me angry. You know, Bruno Mars, sorry, quick, quick side story tangent here. Bruno Mars was attacked for cult, for being for culturally appropriating the music he was making or something that he was getting by or that he was trying uh, people said that he was trying to market himself as black but he was really Puerto Rican or something I don't know something like that and I'm just thinking in my head like what the fuck are you talking about like shut up shut up anybody can make whatever music they want to make it doesn't friggin' matter you know, talk about um, talk about like uh, gatekeeping rule bullshit. It's bullshit, man. It's bullshit. This is why I don't fit in any box. You know, I'm most certainly not a conservative. I'm most certainly not a liberal. I just believe in what's right. I think that's what I does with my politics. What's right? You know. <laughs> I don't know how I got on this. Let's read about Italy. Sorry. I'm I'm sorry. I'm gonna shut up. I'm gonna shut up. Um we talked about that. So so as a result, southern Italians ranging from just south of Rome all the way down to Sicily fled in huge numbers to other countries, including the United States. About 80% of Italian Americans are of southern Italian descent said Fred uh, Gordarpe, I can't pronounce that last name, a professor of Italian-American studies at Queens College. Ships from Palermo went to New Orleans and the ships from G Genoa and Naples went to New York, he says. They spread from there, but the richest pockets of Italian-Americans aren't from New York City. They're clustered in New York City, Long Island, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and in and around Philadelphia. Yet those Italians are all from southern Italy and recent immigrants in close proximity to each other in the United States wouldn't necessarily consider themselves countrymen. That's because each of the old Italian kingdoms had their own, well, the Imperio. That I, I, sorry, I read that inflection wrong. So you have this thing called the Di Imperio, who, uh, who is Italian, calls them dialects. Wait, sorry, I'm reading this wrong. That's because each of the old Italian kingdoms had their own Di Imperio, who is Italian, calls them dialects, but others refer to them in different ways. Basically, the old Italian kingdoms each spoke their own languages that largely come from the same family tree, slightly, but all that much closer than the Romance languages, such as French, French, Spanish, or Portuguese. 
the general family name for these languages is Italo Dalmatian. Dalmatian. Dalmatian? Is that what I'm saying? Dalmatian. It turns out re refers to Croatia. The dog is from there too. So it is Dalmatian. Italo Dalmatian is the general family name for all of these languages. That's right, Mr. Red. That's right. Wow. That, that, that is wacky, wild stuff. They were not all mutually comprehensible and had their own external influences. Calo, uh, Calabrian, for example, is heavily influenced by Greek, thanks to a long Greek occupation and interchange. In the northwest near the border with France, Piedmont, with its capital of Turin, spoke a language called Piedmontese. Piedmontese, which is sort of a Fr Frenchish. Sicilian, very close to North Africa, had a lot of Arabic type stuff in it. Because right? if you cross the Mediterranean, you're in Africa, and that's where the Moors were before they, you know, when they came up to conquer Sicily. Um, I use I use the past tense for these because the languages are dying quickly. Dialects do still exist, but they're spoken mainly by old people, says the Imperio. Sicilian put up more of a fight than most. And you hear, you know, when you hear in like the mythology of the mafia, I don't know how true this is, but like you have to be, you have to be a like full or half or have a grandfather from Sicily and speak the mother tongue. Something like that. During unification, the northern Italian powers decided that, that having a country that spoke about a dozen different languages would pose a bit of a challenge to their efforts. So they picked one and called it standard Italian and made everyone learn it. So not only is this like all the you have all these kingdoms full of all these different crazy languages that are on the general family tree, they then throw a dart at a dartboard and go, boom, that is the, that language, that's Italian. Everybody learned Italian. And of course, they're going to fuse their own kingdom's language with this Italian to make it even more complicated than, than maybe it, it, it might have been. Um, the one that they picked was Tuscan. So Tuscan is the, the de facto Italian language. And they probably picked it because it was the language of Dante, the most famous Italian writer who wrote the Divine Comedy. You can see why they call these languages, you can see why calling these languages dialects is tricky. Standard Italian is just one more dialect, not the base language, which Calabrian or Piedmontese riffs on, which is kind of the implication. Right. When you think of the standard, a great example of this would be Slavic languages. Slavic languages are all like the root, like they all have a root. All the uh, Slavic countries can kind of understand each other. Russians and Ukrainians can understand, Russians can understand Ukrainian and Ukrainians can understand Russians and speak it, even though they don't like to be confused with one another. But they, the, the languages are all very similar and use, you know, some of them use similar alphabets and yada, 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 one, two, three, X, Y, Z. But in this situation, this was just, they just picked Tuscan, you know, Tuscan Italian and the other languages across the country don't use Tuscan Italian as the root. It's not the root. It's not the base, like in Slavic countries. That's what I'm trying to say. Robbie says, De Niro in Godfather 2 spoke a great Sicilian, according to my grandfather. Most people can't speak it today. All that's what happens. The older generations who are fluent, they die off, and it all goes the way of the dodo bird. Standard Italian has variations like any other language, which we'll call accents. Someone from Sicily would have a Sicilian accent, but when speaking standard Italian, a person from Milan will hopefully be able to understand them because at a basic level, they'll be using a language this, which, with the same structure and a vocabulary that is mostly identical. That's crazy. But this gets weird because most Italian Americans can trace their immigrant ancestors back to the time between 1861 and World War I when the vast majority of Italians, quote unquote, such as Italy, 
even existed at the time, wouldn't have spoken the same language at all, and hardly any of them would be speaking the northern Italian dialect that would eventually become standard Italian. See, it's man, it's got what a tragedy too. So much of it is lost, probably lost the time. Linguists say there are two trajectories for a language divorced from its place of origin. It sometimes dies out quickly. People assimilate, speak the most popular language where they live, stop teaching their children the old language. But sometimes the language has a firmer hold on its speakers than most and refuses to entirely let go. That's like what Yiddish, that's exactly the case with Yiddish. The Italian dialects are like that. Um, I grew up speaking English and Italian dialects in my family's region of Pugilia, says Gordarpe. I don't know how to say his name. And when I went to Italy, very few people could understand me, even the people in my parents' region. They recognized that I was speaking as if I was a 70-year-old man when I was only 26 years old. Italian-American Italian is not at all like standard Italian. So the standard Italian, based on the Tuscan Italian that we were talking about, which is not the root language for the Italio uh, Dalmatian family tree of languages. This is the American version of this Tuscan Italian. Italian-American Italian is not at all like standard Italian. Instead, it's a construction of the frozen shards left over from languages that don't even really exist in Italy anymore with minimal intervention from modern Italian because they're all in they're all in America now right i mean that's that's what that's what it seems like um there's a spectrum to all this, of course. Somebody, even in their 70s or 80s, who was born in Italy and lived in the United States can still be understood in Italy. But Italian has undergone huge standardization changes in the past few decades. And it will be hard for modern Italian speakers to understand them, even harder than if somebody showed up in New York today speaking in 1920s New Yorker, Thoidi Thoid street slang and accent and by the way the new york accent that we all know and love and make fun of and you know imitate and whatnot new the, that that accent is actually dutch it comes from the dutch when the dutch came the dutch lived in in manhattan in new york before before we, america was even a country and so that accent is finds its roots in in Dutch, in, in the Dutch accent. Kind of crazy when you think about it. Uh, for whatever reason, foods and curse words linger longer in a disrupted language. I think of my own complete lack of, lack of knowledge of Yiddish. See, with my lousy vocabulary made up entirely of words like blintzes, kugel, kvetch, nudnik, and schmuck. Those are all... I know every one of those. So kvetch means to uh, whine. Uh, a nudnik is like a, is like a is like a, a moron, and a schmuck is also a moron. Blintzes are, are foods. Kugel is a food. Um, you would say um, have some rachmunas, which means compassion. Um, Mishigas is like you know nonsense. You know we have all these words and. It, not connected to a spoken language. They're just words that we knew from our grandparents, you know, have a, have a, a, a kibitz. A kibitz is like having a, a little talk. A nosh is like eating, a, you know, having a snack. Um, Anne-Marie Olivia Shaw, who grew up and studied social linguistics of Long Island, thinks various pockets of Southern Italian immigrants could understand each other sort of a little. Jersey Italians are not linguistically distant, distinct from New York or Rhode Island or Philadelphia Italians who, sp uh, when speaking Italian. Generally, being fairly close in proximity, even if they were only speaking uh, similar languages, they would necessarily have some cultural similarities. Culinarily, similarities, similarities are also abound less meat heavy, more like province or Greece in the use of seafood, vegetables, and even rare for Western Europe, spice. 
Capagola and mozzarella are probably creations of Southern Italy. Though there are versions elsewhere and Italians love to argue about who invented what. I mean, that is true. When you think about mozzarella does not really have, it's, it's not, um, there's not a lot of spice in, in mozzarella, you know, uh, there, I mean, there's no spice, there's no spice in any of it. It's just very, when you think, when you want to use an adjective to describe mozzarella, mozzarella, you think of creamy, buttery, and more than anything, you think about the word fresh. When I think about mozzarella cheese, I think about freshness, you know, if anything, it's the, it's the, the tomato and the basil and the balsamic vinegar that is going to do the work in the flavor department. That's not to say that mozzarella cheese doesn't have a flavor. It has a wonderful sort of flavor. But if you just eat raw, fresh mozzarella cheese, it's kind of, it's a very, very light, very, very mild cheese. It's one of my favorite cheeses too. Um, and they share similar qualities linguistically as well. Let's do a fun experiment and take three separate linguistic trends from Southern Italian dialects and combine them all to show how one standard Italian word can be so thoroughly mangled in the United States. Ready for this? First, the features that you'll find across a lot of these dialects uh, and one that you'll still hear a lot in Southern Italy today is vowels at the end of words are pronounced very, very softly and used more of a uh vowel, says Olivia Shaw. The impero is a little more extreme, calling it vowel deletion. Basically, if the final symbol is a vowel, you can get rid of it. Vowel deletion is common in many languages and is done for the same reason that sometimes vowels are added to make the flow from one word to another more seamless. Now let's tie this into the misfits for a brief moment. This is kind of crazy. What does Glenn Danzig do when he is singing a misfit song, sometimes live or whatever? He is always never finishing the vowels at the ends of words when he sings it live. He just sort of trails off is this because of his Italian American New Jersey upbringing? Is this connected to that? Is that why Glenn Danzig does that? Is Glenn Danzig just doing vowel deletion as a result of his Italian heritage by way of wherever his family came from in Italy? I truly wonder, and I can't think of a good example right now off the top of my head but they're definitely there live examples where he just sort of he just sort of trails off he never finishes what it is that he's saying and just moves on to the next verse or the next lyric or whatever it that man that stuff is fascinating that blows my mind when you think about that what do you guys think do you think that's is that am i off on that or is there something to it there um Sometimes vowels are added to make flow from more. more blah, blah, blah. Um, Robbie's Robbie Bloodshed says, My mind is blown by this. Someone needs to ask and alone this. I mean, right? Like, it's like you know what I'm talking about. He'll just be singing a song and he'll just be like, you know, he'll just like trail off. I'm, not, I'm trying to like figure out how I can like do an example. I can't, but it's definitely there. It's definitely there. He just sort of doesn't finish the sentence, and it's because of vowel deletion by way of Ital being a New Jersey Italian-American and growing up in that same environment that you kind of have grown up in, in that way, you know? Um, it's easiest in terms of muscle movement to transition from a vowel to a consonant and vice versa. It's all about flow. It's all about the flow. When Glenn is singing it live, it's so much easier to conserve your wind energy, you know what I mean, or whatever, your breath or, you know, your vocal cords, however you want to put it. You're conserving it by not completing the sentence. Um, a vowel to a vowel is difficult in English. That's why we have an A versus an N in phrases like a potato or an apple. Some Italian words that would follow food words such as prepositions or articles 
would start with a vowel and it's easier just to remove it so you don't have to do the vowel to vowel transition, right? Robbie says, a good example is fuck. Fangul is really, what the? Fangul. Wait, what? A good, so you always hear that. Fangul. It's really vafakulo. What? Um, let's see what the examples they use here are. The stereotypical Italian, it's a me, Mario. Addition of a vowel is done for the same reason. Italian is a very fluid musical language, and Italian speakers will try to emanate the awkwardness of going consonant to consonant. So they'll just add in a generic vowel sound, ah, or uh, between consonants to make it flow better. So, okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, a natural Italian speaker, and again, gross generalization here, not talking about anybody in specific, not trying to be stereotypical, just trying to, just a gross generalization understanding. Because Italian is a musical language, it flows. When you hear, it's true. When you hear Italian, it feels like it just flows. It's such a smooth, it's not like, it's not like German, which feels very angular and sharp and abrasive. You know, Hebrew can be sharp and abrasive as well. Italian just, you know, flows off the tongue and, you know, mi bella, mi bella. <laughs> you know, it just, it just, it just goes and it goes. And so a, a non-native English speaker's natural inclination being Italian is to put an extra consonant in there to make it flow the way it would if they were speaking Italian. Second, a lot of O sounds will be, as we call in linguistics, raised. So it'll be pronounced more like O, says Olivia Shaw. Got it? O is O. <laughs> o. <laughs> and third, a lot of what we call the voiceless consonants, consonants, like a K sound, will be pronounced as a voiced consonant, says Olivia Shaw. This is a tricky one to explain, but basically the difference between a voiced and a voiceless consonant can be felt if you place your fingers over your Adam's apple and say as short of a sound with the consonant as you can. A voice, let me see, a voiced consonant will cause a vibration and a voice, voiceless consonant will not. So just like when you try to make a g sound, it'll come out as g. <laughs> But a k, whoa, I feel it. But a k can be made without using the vocal cords at all, preventing the vibration. G, k, g, k. It's true. It's so true. I just did it. You feel the vibration. G, k. There's no vibration when you do it. Okay, so we've got the three linguistic quirks common. So it was the, what was it? It was the, like the O, the G, and the whatever. Um, Okay, so we've got the three linguistic quirks common to most of the Southern Italian ancient languages. Now try to pronounce Capicola. The C, which are really K, the K, Capicola K, uh, sounds become voice. So they turn into a G because you're trying to make it flow. G. So, you've, so K becomes Gabba. Oh my God. Uh, do the same with the P. The p, p. Since it's a voiceless consonant, we want voice ones. So change that to a b. Th this is in a way, in a weird, bizarre way. It's almost like like um, like Cockney rhyming slang. A little bit, like sort of. The second to last vowel, uh, an o, sound gets raised. So change it to an u, and toss out the last syllable. It's just a vowel. Who needs it? Now try it again. Ga Gabagool. Gabagool. That is so amazing to me. This is amazing stuff. If you were to uh, if you were to go to southern Italy, you wouldn't find people saying gabagool. But some of the old quirks of the old language. So literally, these inflections, these these transformations that happen in America are basically a result of 
of of people who speak English as a second language using their, you know, their Italian mechanics, you know, verbal mechanics to abbreviate Italian English words in a whole new way, which end up transforming one word into another word and making it completely unrecognizable. Mind blown. If you were able to follow that with me, I know this is kind of complicated. It's, but, ah, it's so cool. So cool. Um, but some of the old quirks, you really have to go through the whole thing in order to really break it down and then understand what's being said here. But some of the old quirks, the old languages uh, survived into accents of standard Italian. Wait, sorry. I, if you're going to go to southern Italy, you wouldn't find people saying Gabagool. But some of the old quirks of the old languages survived in the accents of, stab, of the standard Italian used there. So basically, some of the, 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 the quirks and things that, that are made up of those languages of the kingdoms that are all a part of that, that Dalmatian family tree are baked into that Italian, right? In Sicily or Calabria, you might indeed find someone ordering mozzarella in their own weird way. Jersey and New York and Rhode Island and Philadelphia Italians are keeping the flame of their languages alive even better than Italian Italians. There's something both a little silly and a little wonderful about someone who doesn't even speak the language putting on an antiquated accent for a dead sub-language in order to order some cheese. That's literally what's happening. Language is so much a part of how we identify uh, in as well as food is. Um, the way we speak is who we are. I think that for Italians, we have such a pride in our ancestry and such a pride in our culture that it is just kind of an unconscious way of expressing that. Correction. An earlier version of the story had the wrong age for Fred. The story was updated with new images and minor edits on October 25th, 2018. So, so there you have it, folks. I, I mean... I, that might have been a really boring episode for for this channel, the show. But you know, I haven't done a misfit show yet. I'm gonna do a misfit show eventually. I just, you know, I was so worried about. First of all, I, I don't really want to waste one of my my good topics while I'm out here because, again, I, I've gotten lucky twice now with the Wi-Fi. We haven't had any hiccups, which is good. But uh, like, if, I, I know I seem to be making this up, but I'm really not. The Wi-Fi is terrible. It takes me forever to upload a YouTube video. And uh, I've just gotten lucky twice. I had to bring my computer outside in order to do this streaming because the router is right there. And when you go up in the house, the house is made out of like thick concrete. So, you know, it doesn't, the Wi-Fi signal does not carry well throughout this house. As a matter of fact, there's two Wi-Fi routers on the opposite side of the house for that specific reason. Um, oh, wow. I'm really glad you think so, Rob. Robbie says it's definitely not a boring one. I'm glad to hear that. I, I, I hope, I hope other people might, might think so as well. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. So like I said, going to try and do the evil live streaming show. I, I, I've never, I haven't missed a week. I think in almost in over a year, this is like the first time that I've missed a week, but nobody seems to be complaining. So Maybe they don't care. Um, no, I'm going to try and do it. I'm going to definitely try and do it. I need to do it because I need to, I just need to be churning out as much content as possible for reasons I can't explain. Um, additionally, my feature length film, Romeo's Distress, I, it's just been sitting on the shelf, not doing anything. It doesn't look like the Blu-ray is going to be coming out anytime soon. I'm seeing a lot of my peers put films out on YouTube. Some of the films are getting a lot of traffic because people like to watch feature length films on YouTube. Now it's become very in vogue. I don't know why some of them, not at all. I have no idea if Romeo's distress will be watched or not watched. I don't know. I really don't know. I am so going to try and just put it out there. So I have two coming out. I have one with the commentary track. That's supposed to be for Blu-ray and I have the other one. It has been censored for YouTube because there's some graphic content in there that I didn't think would pass YouTube's um, strict guidelines. So it is censored. So the only way to see it will be on the eventual uncut Blu-ray version. 
when it comes out on Blu-ray, I will definitely, I will definitely be um, taking it off of YouTube. I'm just leaving it up for now. I don't think anybody gives a shit. No one's trying to pirate my dinky little film. Mr. Red, um, yes, it's uh, if you like uh, midnight movies, if you like movies like John Waters films or Troma or Night of the Living Dead or film noir films, you will enjoy Romeo's Distress somewhat. Um, so, yeah, so keep your eyes peeled. That's probably in about two weeks. We got the Screaming Jay Hawkins video. Is coming out August 6th. If you are a Patreon, you can watch the Screaming Jay Hawkins video next week. Everybody else will have to wait over a month. Um, Sam Hain listening party should drop very, very soon. I, I time these things out on the channel. Um, and I'm going to continue to try and do this. I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Red. I'm going to try and do this as often as I can. Tomorrow is Shabbat, so I won't be able to... I'll have to keep my electronics to my room situation uh so it'll just be a blog video for tomorrow but i am going to try and do this i have like a list of of topics that i've had in a google docs thing for some time now uh and these were two of them actually these were the this one and, and the one yesterday um from these wonderful sites all things interesting atlas obscura and i just knew at some point the next one at some we're going to do the rock Behind the scenes, top 10 behind the scenes from The Rock. Love that movie. Love Nicolas Cage, big fan. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I can tell you. Nothing. Please, if you have not joined the Patreon, please consider doing it. If you enjoy this content, please consider buying a cup of coffee. Uh, when you buy a cup of coffee, you are keeping this channel running and keeping everything going. So please consider doing that as well. Or just letting the ads run on these videos is great, too. And I guess that's really all I have to say. Uh, if there's a topic you'd like me to sort of go over and digest and masticate on this channel, just let me know, and I will consider it. Thank you so much for your viewer participation. Uh, it is super late. I have to go to sleep because i got to wake up tomorrow. Like we always say, peace and...